July 1889, the world heavyweight champion, John L. Sullivan, defended his title against the latest challenger to his crown. But this was not professional boxing as we know it. The protagonists fought with bare knuckles, and the fight itself was illegal, held in secret, deep in a Mississippi forest. Prize fighting uh, in the 1880s was, was still an outlaw pursuit. It was basically on the fringes of society. Those who participated were seen as brutal, barbaric. These were hard men, living a hard life during a hard time. But within five years, boxing was on its way to becoming the biggest spectator sport in the world. It was a revolution made possible by a new set of rules, a code of conduct which civilized boxing and made it socially acceptable. But despite this taming of the sport, the public has always been drawn to the bad men of boxing, throwbacks to the vicious days of bare knuckle brawls. We're drawn to it with, while not even knowing we're being drawn to it. We think we're being repelled, we're being drawn. They explode in the ring. Miss, miss, bang! From John L. Sullivan to Jack Dempsey in the Roaring Twenties, to Mike Tyson in today's multi-million dollar extravaganzas, these are the champions whose natural aggressiveness has stretched boxing's code to its limits and beyond. If you talk about John L. Sullivan, Jack Dempsey, and Mike Tyson, those words, savage and explosive, apply to all three. They're almost like brothers in savagery. This is the story of our fascination with three of the most ruthless champions in the history of boxing. Fighters whose brutal instincts challenged but were ultimately tamed by the rules of the ring. <laughs> By 1889, John L. Sullivan was already well known in America, renowned for his aggression both in and out of the ring. John L. Sullivan was quite a fella. He liked the ladies, he liked drinking, he liked to parade into a saloon and slam his fist on the bar and proclaim he could whip any man in the place, and he could do it too. By today's standards, Sullivan's title fight in Mississippi was barbaric. Sullivan and the challenger, Jake Kilrain, fought with bare knuckles under the archaic London prize ring rules. Wrestling holds were allowed, and rounds only ended when one man went down. When the fight started, John L. rushed out, so we went right at him, took a swipe and missed. Jake Kilrain got a wrestling hold around his neck and threw him down, and within five or ten seconds, Jake had won the first round. But the first round was deceptive. This was to become an epic battle lasting 75 rounds, over two and a quarter hours. Despite the temperature of 105 degrees, Kilrain managed to drink a quart of whiskey during the fight. A lot of the fighters back then, Kilrain included, would use alcohol to kind of numb themselves during these fights. And you can understand why it kind of dulled the pain, dulled their senses a bit. And these fights, again, were not when you got into the later rounds of these fights, they weren't contests of skill. They were contests of endurance and power. As the fight drew to a climax, it was clear why bare-knuckle boxing was banned in every state in America. Both fighters had terrible injuries, and Kilrain was barely conscious. Kilrain himself was, was almost lumpy with swelling. He had purple and red welts all around his body where John had hit him and his face in some descriptions was nearly um, uh, unrecognizable. Uh, they said his wife wouldn't recognize him if she had seen him. And it dragged on for 75 rounds and uh, a tremendous amount of time for a prize fight. Finally, Sullivan's brute strength was too much for Kilrain. After yet another knockdown, his seconds were unable to rouse him, and John L. Sullivan was declared the winner.
But while Sullivan was enjoying his celebrity, the sport that made him was changing. In 1867, a new set of rules for boxing had been formulated in England, the Queensbury Rules. The Marcus of Queensbury Rules I think changed boxing more in the sense that it became a spectator sport with those rules, more so than it, than it kind of did what it was meant to do, and that was protect the fighters. Now you could build stadiums to host fights. Fights were legal. Uh, you could charge admission. So now you have a money-making venture just getting people to come to the fight. It was only on condition that the Queensbury rules were applied that the authorities in New Orleans allowed Sullivan to defend his title there in September 1892. His opponent was the young Californian Jim Corbett, an athlete and a former bank clerk who prided himself on being a new breed of boxer, a quick-thinking, fast-footed, technical fighter. By the third round, it was obvious that Sullivan's usual bullying manner was not going to work against the scientific approach of Jim Corbett. Despite the Queensbury rules giving him a minute's rest between each three-minute round, Sullivan's lack of fitness made him an easy target for the younger man. The first punch that Corbett landed solidly broke John L. Sullivan's nose, and it was basically downhill from there. Corbett stuck with his plan. His plan was to basically box, wear out Sullivan, and then knock him out when he was right for the knockout, which he did uh, in the 21st round, and, and so ended the, the reign of John L. Sullivan. Sullivan heard words for him that he'd never heard before. Eight, nine, ten, you're out. Sullivan came kind of from that older, slower world. His Corbett kind of represented that newer, kind of hyped up America of, of prosperity and strength and, and innovation. And, you know, uh, it was a very interesting you know, microcosm, that fight, because it was old America and new America. And uh, I think there was no way Sullivan could win because his time had passed. Sullivan took the defeat badly. Alcohol and overeating beat his attempts at a comeback and he never fully accepted that the world had moved on. It was ironic then that the next great popular champion in heavyweight boxing would be another throwback to the older, slower America, but this time from the western frontier. In 1914, Jack Dempsey was a teenage vagrant, one of thousands of young vagabonds drifting around America. He rode the freight trains, looking for work and the chance to fight. He was a hobo. He was a wanderlust kid, back from an era in this last century in which people just roamed to find themselves and to find a resting point. He rode the rails. He fought in saloons that had sawdust on the floor. In his early teens, Dempsey had left home to find casual work in the mines and logging camps of the Rocky Mountains. Like John L. Sullivan, he realized the one thing he could do better than anyone else was fight. He would take on anybody. He always said to me that was more dangerous than in the ring. Because in the ring, there are rounds, there are gloves, there's a referee. Bar fighting was the most dangerous fighting he did. And one of Dempsey's philosophies in the ring, he put very well, he said, the sooner the safer. That's why he liked to knock people out in the first round. He got to New York about 1916, and nobody heard of him. And he said, well, he was the heavyweight champion of the Rocky Mountains. There was no such title. And he had no money for a hotel, so he slept in Central Park and would go on trying to get a fight. Dempsey's aggression and street fighting style soon brought him to the attention of legendary boxing promoter Tex Rickard. Tex Rickard was easily the greatest boxing promoter in history. Not only had he put on fights since 1906 uh, in gold mining towns, because he was a gold miner himself, but he comes to Madison Square Garden in New York and he puts on Dempsey fights. Yes, he rides Jack Dempsey's coattails, 
but without Tex Rickard, there'd have been no Jack Dempsey. By 1919, Dempsey had knocked out so many opponents that Tex Rickard decided this was the moment to move him up to the big time. Rickard put together the fight that Dempsey had always dreamed of against the reigning heavyweight champion of the world, Jess Willard. Willard was a true giant and the most feared boxer of the day. At six feet six, he was six inches taller than Dempsey and 58 pounds heavier. To the boxing public, Dempsey didn't stand a chance. All the time he was training for Willard, this behemoth, they never let him see Willard. And his manager, Doc Kern, said, yeah, Willard's big, sure, but he's a tub of lord. He's out of shape. And Dempsey said, I got in the ring and I saw him. And he was six foot five, 250 pounds, and there was not an ounce of fat on him. He said, and right then I realized I was not fighting for the championship. I was fighting for my life. The fight took place in front of a crowd of 18,000 in Toledo, Ohio, on the 4th of July, 1919. Jess Willard was one of those guys who was, who was gigantic. He was a mammoth among heavyweights. Wasn't much of a fighter, didn't have any speed. And Dempsey had speed, he had elusiveness. One of the elements of his style was fighting out of a crouch. He liked doing that because he could get leverage out of his left hook and he would get recoil action and he could hurt people. He, very powerful puncher. So after 90 seconds of circling, suddenly there was a little opening and Dempsey threw a left hook through the opening. The hardest single punch that's recorded. It stove in the side of Willard's face. Teeth went flying out of the ring. The bone under the eye was broken, the nose was broken. And Willard sort of slumped down. They maneuver around the feather ring. Now watch, watch. There, that big. Oh. In the case we have here, Jack Dempsey is a very, very vicious man. And as you see, he fights like someone having eaten for five days. There's that back again, and Willard's on the floor for the second time. You must understand, this was a young Dempsey who's wow, he's 24 years old. Everything's explosive. He's tight. He's ready to go. And look at him now. It's just unbelievable what he's doing. For the next two rounds, Dempsey continued his assault on the wounded giant. Even the spectators are beginning to flinch at the sight. This is no fight. It's a slaughter, a massacre. Jack Dempsey just hit and continued to hit because he had a, a very slow target. As the third round drew to a close, the fight literally became a bloodbath. Remarkably, Willard stayed on his feet, although he could barely see. And so finally, the accumulative damage just polished Willard off until he just quit in the corner. Now coming up for round four, but Willard can't come out for the fourth round. His nose and cheekbone are fractured, ribs broken, half a dozen teeth knocked out, and he's hardly strength enough to rise and shake hands with his conqueror. In this most unusual of fights, an idol has been born. Like Sullivan before him, Dempsey became a folk hero. But America now had mass media, and crowds flocked to see the fight on cinema newsreels. Dempsey was a national star, and boxing was the sport on everyone's lips. The way boxing changed with Dempsey was it became a big-time sport, and after boxing, other sports became big-time with huge numbers. Congressmen are going, captains of industry, ladies in furs and diamonds. Boxing became you know, fashionable and, and very, very glamorous, and Dempsey was very glamorous. Success raised Dempsey's life outside the ring to stellar levels. Despite the clamor of his fans for more fights, he stopped boxing altogether and went into show business. And in the 1920s, that meant Hollywood. He was in this newfound medium called movies, even did a serial. Couldn't act that worth a lick. I 
I mean, he couldn't act his way from here to the bar and ask for a drink. The fairy tale continued when Dempsey married his co-star Estelle Taylor. With his easy, seductive Hollywood lifestyle, he no longer had the hunger to fight. He got a nose job. He palled around with Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks. They were part of his group. He retired while he was unretired. By 1926, Dempsey hadn't been in the ring for over two years. It took all Tex Rickard's guile to persuade him to defend his title again. Rickard put up half a million dollars for Dempsey to return to the ring, but there was a problem. By 26, Dempsey was inactive, basically. And in boxing terminology, he was an old man. In contrast, the challenger, Gene Tunney, was three years younger than Dempsey. Tunney was university educated, a reader of Shakespeare, and a friend of George Bernard Shaw, the polar opposite to everything Dempsey stood for. Tunney saw himself as a sophisticated scientific boxer. Tunney was a kind of a graduate of the Jim Corbett School, and he practiced the science. He thought constantly of how he could become a better fighter. And, and also was a great strategist. He would study his opponent. The fight took place in the open air in Philadelphia on September the 23rd, 1926. The crowd of over 130,000 was and still is the greatest number of people ever assembled for a boxing match. As the fight began, it started to rain. Within minutes, there was a torrential downpour soaking the ring, the boxers, and the spectators. Tunney was not a big knockout puncher like Dempsey, but he was a slashing puncher. Dempsey's taking a pretty good beating up to now. His face is badly swollen. His right eye is cut and closed. From the early rounds, it was obvious that Dempsey was slow and out of condition. Tunney's speed meant he could avoid Dempsey's heavy punches, and with his superior technique, he simply outboxed the champion. A major upset was unfolding before the huge crowd. The end of the fight. When the fight ended, America went into shock. Honey, the winner by unanimous decision. Dempsey had been defeated by youth, speed and science. But if his fans couldn't believe it, Dempsey himself was more sanguine about the loss. Dempsey went back to the hotel. His face looked like chopped meat and all these cuts under the eyes. And Estelle Taylor gasped, and she said, what happened? And Dempsey said, with that joie de vie you always at, honey, I forgot to duck. Despite the manner of his defeat, Dempsey was determined to regain his title. His public believed he could. When the inevitable rematch came a year later in Chicago, Dempsey was the clear betting favorite but Tunney had shifted the odds in his favor. Before the fight, Tunney had invoked the rules of boxing to insist on a 20-foot ring, rather than Dempsey's preferred 16-foot. The larger ring gave Tunney more room to move and avoid Dempsey's heavy punches. Tunney in the white trunks, weighs 189 pounds tonight. Dempsey, 194. As in the previous fight, it soon became clear that Dempsey was in trouble against the younger and fitter champion. And yet for six rounds, Dempsey bravely chased after Tunney, taking the blows and losing every round. But Dempsey wasn't quite finished yet. And in the seventh round, he caught Tunney with a left hook from hell. I mean, he could throw that left hook, probably the best in the history of boxing, even more than Joe Frazier or anyone. Caught Tunney, and then rained punches on her, about seven of them, as Tunney just slid down the ropes. Tunney is down. Referee Dave Barry motions Dempsey to an neutral corner. Dempsey said, oh, I had him down, I had him down. He said, I've, I've been waiting for this for years, and, and his attack was never more fierce than when he had Tunney going down. Dempsey hovered over Tunney so he could finish him, at which point the referee Dave Barry was trying to send him over to the neutral corner before 
before he started his count. What happened next became one of the most controversial incidents in boxing history, the long count. In his eagerness to finish Tunney off, Dempsey forgot he had to go to a neutral corner before the count was started. This new rule had just been introduced to avoid the kind of damage Dempsey had done to Jess Willard. Which begets the controversy that Tunney was down for 14 seconds. The Dempsey fans insist more than 10 seconds have elapsed, but Barry's count is still going on. Count is nine, Tunney is up. Tunney got up and just ran, which Tunney could do. He could run faster backwards than he could forward. He'd always practiced it. And now he put it into operation. Dempsey's fans yelling to Jack the corner, Tunney. Tunney's clever use of the rules to have the ring as large as possible now paid off, as he used the space to keep out of Dempsey's reach while he recovered from the knockdown. And he's running and running, and Dempsey throws a short right and slips. A right cross on the button, and Dempsey is down for a count of one. The referee goes one. Tony wasn't in a neutral corner. How come you have one set of rules for Dempsey and another set of rules for Gene Tunney? I'll tell you why. Because the referee was in the hands of the mob. And he was going to give Tunney every break he could. Whether or not the referee was crooked, Dempsey's failure to stick to the rules may have cost him the fight. Apart from that one moment, he was completely outboxed by the better conditioned Tunney and lost comprehensively on points. Dempsey never fought again, but although he'd lost to a more modern, sophisticated boxer, it was Jack Dempsey whose name became legend. Boxing moved on, but the memory of Dempsey's raw power lived on in the public's imagination. And 50 years later, it was Dempsey's ruthlessness in the ring that inspired a boy who would become the greatest fighter of the end of the 20th century, Mike Tyson. As a teenager, Tyson would spend hours analyzing old films of Dempsey in action. I, I'm crazy about Jack Dempsey because of his ferocious intensity. You know, there's no one like him. No one like him. They maneuver around the side of the ring. Now watch, watch. There's that big left, and Willard down. They get back on the old fighters. I would like to be something like them. I like to be not much what flamboyant or something uh, arrogant, you could say, but just to be in a way. Yes, different from all the fighters nowadays. It's not surprising that Tyson could relate to what he called Dempsey's ferocious intensity. Growing up in the deprived housing projects of Brownsville in Brooklyn, New York, he was a child without a father, a bullet boy who became a bully himself. For Tyson, breaking the rules was a way to survive. By the time he was 12, Tyson already had over 30 convictions for offenses involving theft and violence. I don't know if they ever realized how intelligent he was. And sometimes intelligence can uh, manifest itself in, um, in um, sort of uh, obstinate reactions. And, but you have to know that. You have to know that you're dealing with an intelligent creature. You know, Mike Tyson needed a father figure. It's as simple as that. Like Dempsey before him, boxing was to become Tyson's escape from poverty. At 14, he was sent from Brooklyn to a reform school in Upper New York State. From there, he was paroled into the custody of legendary boxing trainer Cus D'Amato in the quiet town of Catskill. At last, Tyson had found the father figure he'd been lacking. I looked at him. He showed him that, that he was strong, could take a very good punch, and would keep coming. So that, of course, told me the basic things I wanted to know. So I told him that, yes, you could be made a fighter. All right, I'm going to wait. I'm Plus, to when he found Mike, yes, Mike was a terrible kid. And yes, Mike was difficult to deal with. But he knew that wasn't the real Mike Tyson. He thought, if I can get to the real Mike Tyson, strip away all of the junk and build upon what's inside and have this blank canvas for the first time, he could add to that canvas. Well, I mean, I Customato had already trained two world champions, 
Floyd Patterson and Jose Torres. The precocious Mike Tyson had the same determination to get to the top. Uh, he said to me that uh, he wanted to be like me, champion of the world. And uh, he was shy. Costa Maro told me that day, this kid is going is to grow up to be the heavyweight champion of the world. And I thought that Cos was crazy. And I said, well, I hope so. He said, no, no, he's going to be the heavyweight champion of the world. By 1982, Customato knew that the 16-year-old Tyson was beginning to show his true potential. Coming real good now. Always look to get to the side like that. Remember, from the side, you can let that punch go with the worst kind of intention because you know he can't hit you back. Tyson's boxing ability had become awesome, a throwback to the street fighting style of his hero, Jack Dempsey. That took your body right into the now, Customato harnessed Tyson's natural aggression to turn him into the ultimate modern boxer. Not only you gotta throw punches, you gotta learn how to miss punches, you know what that means? These are the tricks of the old times, that's how they gotta learn. Cos would talk to him every day, show him intellectually the the important intellectual weaponry and cause uh, convinced Tyson in, in two or three days that, that boxing was more here than here. Your mind is not in your way. There's something distracting you. He struck me as uh, intelligent. Uneducated, of course, but intelligent. He knew what was happening around him and to him. It wasn't like he was just some lug, some lump, you know, he, he, he could understand things. I like being sometimes a little arrogant, a little bit, not much, just a little bit, and you know, a little spoiled, I like that. That's me, and it's always gonna be me. I'm not gonna try to change it for nobody. Still only 16, Mike Tyson was introduced to the boxing world in the heats of the 1982 Junior Olympics. Punch the body, what are you gonna do when you get inside? I'm gonna open up like a son of a bitch. Eight-second knockout in the first round. Eight-second knockout. I was so certain that he would win the tournament, which most people thought I was crazy. I went and ordered a big banner to string across Main Street in Catskill here. Welcome home, champ. Very, very strong. Brown has taken... True to Customato's prediction, Tyson went on to win the Junior Olympic title. A new era in heavyweight boxing was about to begin. Tyson jump on the roof. That is it. They threw the towel in. Threw the towel in. He didn't want to see. He didn't want to see his boxer hurt. I think the towel hit the canvas about 35 seconds into the fight. Look at old Tyson. He's falling on the ground with joy. Tyson turned professional in 1985. In the next year, he fought 17 times and knocked out every one of his opponents. Now he was being hailed as the most exciting new heavyweight boxer since Muhammad Ali. Knockout after knockout after knockout. The new Jack Dempsey. And the public felt that. And they loved it. The miracle of Tyson was that he was so much smaller than the other heavyweights he was facing. It, it was, he, was, he was tiny. He didn't have the arm reach to, be, to stand off and be scientific and use the jab. He had to get into you and hit you harder than you could hit him and do it fast. But Tyson received his own knockout blow in November 1986 when Cus D'Amato died, a week before Tyson was due to fight reigning champion Trevor Burbick for the world heavyweight title. Despite his grief, Tyson insisted the fight go ahead. Both wearing black Burbick with the high black stockings. As the contest began, Tyson's team were anxious that his focus might not be on the fight. But in the second round, Tyson showed the world the kind of fighter he really was. Is to twice. There's another big shot by Tyson. Burbick in a heap of trouble. Down he goes. Customato's predictions now became reality as Tyson demolished Trevor Burbick to become the youngest ever heavyweight world champion. That was 
a right to the body and an uppercut to the head, and Furbick is down. This one is going to be over, I believe. It's over. That's all. And we have a new era in boxing. After the fight, he said something wonderful. He said, you know, that uh, Cus was in heaven, looking down, telling all the great fighters, my boy made it. That was the special part. Tyson had proved that even in the modern age, sheer destructive punching power could win the world title. For those who helped him get there, the emotion was overwhelming. Mike gave me the opportunity to walk in the ring, the heavyweight champion of the world. For God, there's no way to explain what that's like. There's no way I can repay him for being in such a spot with such excitement when they announced the heavyweight champion of the world, Mike Tyson. Like Jack Dempsey before him, success turned Tyson into an international celebrity. Out of the ring, he was a commercial goldmine, projecting a wholesome image that helped sell everything from soft drinks to his own life story. Hello, I'm Mike Tyson. Those of you who followed my boxing career know that I've accomplished a lot in a short period of time. It happened way back in 1980 when I first met Customato, the world famous trainer and manager. He's on a pedestal right now in the world's eye. And he knew it. And he loved it. He didn't work around with Rolls Royces. He didn't have diamonds. He didn't have gold watches. But he, when he walked down the street, people adored him. As the most valuable property in world boxing, Tyson was now the target of a bidding war between boxing promoters, including the flamboyant and unpredictable Don King. At that time, Don King was the top promoter, and he could get the most money for, for Tyson. I said, you can negotiate with Don King. If he offers you the best deal, you go with Don King. As Tex Rickard had influenced Jack Dempsey, Don King now began to take over Tyson's life. But Tyson was emotionally fragile. Unlike Dempsey, he found it hard to deal with the growing demands on him. When Mike was with Customato, it's almost like having a Ming vase. If you have a Ming vase and you want to show it to someone, pick it up and put it here. When Don King got Mike, he said, here, catch. Every decision made for Mike was in Don King's best interest. In the same way that Customato's personality rubbed off on Mike Tyson, Don carefully and calculatingly put all these layers back on Mike. The hate, the racism, all of that demeanor that Don knew would keep Mike away from everyone. That's not the real Mike Tyson. In another strange parallel with Jack Dempsey's life, at around this time, Tyson fell in love with an actress, the television soap star, Robin Givens. Mike had been seeing Robin in 1987. And when I spoke to her at that time, whenever I interacted with her or anyone else did, she was warm, she was kind, she was wonderful until the day they got married and it was a completely reversal. I'm Mrs. Mike Tyson, I'm taking over. But after only eight months of marriage, Tyson's world fell apart when Robin Givens left him and filed for divorce, claiming Tyson was a violent manic depressive. She walked away with half his fortune. And was still invincible. That is, until a routine defense of his title against the 40-to-1 outsider, James Buster Douglas, in Tokyo in 1990. If he's able to hold Mike up, this thing could go a few rounds. If he can hold Mike up, Mike will dispose of it early. For the first few rounds, Tyson was lethargic and slow. It seemed that his problems outside the ring might be affecting his performance in it. But in the eighth round, normal service was resumed. Oh, that's a nice uppercut this time! The drop Buster Douglas! He 
knocks Douglas down. It was very poor performance up until that point. But now he's regained his heavyweight championship. He's still heavyweight champion, Mike. Two, three, four. Mike is retains the heavyweight championship of the world. Five, six, seven. Mike retains eight, nine. What makes Douglas get up at nine and three quarters and then turn the fight around? The gods looked down on Mike and said, no, not anymore. And it was the scariest thing I've ever seen. As with Dempsey in the long count, Tyson thought he'd knocked Douglas out of the fight. But now, the unthinkable happened. For the first time, Tyson was shown to be fallible in the ring. Now the same was happening outside it. After the Douglas fight, physically Mike was still fine, but emotionally and mentally Mike is shot. Tyson's behavior out of the ring began to mirror his savage reputation in it. In 1992, he was arrested for the rape of beauty queen Desiree Washington. Tyson was found guilty and spent three years in prison. But even that didn't change his attitude. After his release, he seemed to lose touch with all the normal rules of society. Doesn't no matter what I say, your guys got, your, it doesn't affect you guys because your guys don't care about nothing but money. So every now and then I kick your f***ing ass and stomp on you and put some kind of pain, inflict some kind of pain on you because you deserve to feel the pain, somewhat of the pain that I feel. I think there was a time when Mike Tyson was with Customato that he tried to please the outside world. He wanted to be what people wanted him to be, which was a tiger in the ring, but more socially acceptable outside of it. For whatever reason, he found that difficult. He couldn't conform to that image. So basically he said, well, if I can't make you love me, it's okay to accept your hate. You've got people that are used to exerting their, their will on other men, um, that they don't know when it stops. And, um, and that's when it gets out of hand and we all say that's terrible. But by the same token, some element of that is what we applauded in the ring to begin with. Despite a second prison term for assault, Tyson remained a huge box office attraction. In 2002, he got another shot at the world title against reigning champion Lennox Lewis. But at the pre-fight press conference, he still seemed hell-bent on public self-destruction. Lennox Lewis! Something switched on him because he was just looking at me mean took off his hat, he threw it on the ground, started walking over to me. At that point, my security came in and like, yo, this ain't part of the script. Once again, Tyson showed he was incapable of playing by the rules, launching himself at Lewis and biting the champion in the leg. I was just in dismay, disarray, wondering what's wrong with this guy. It became a question of the self-fulfilling prophecy. It was like, well, well, is that what you think of me? Is that what you think of me? All right, then, that's what I'll be. But even by Tyson's standards, his tirade at the press conference was an all-time low. These are some of the intimidating things that a sucker does, a fool does, you know, somebody that's, you know, realizing that, oh, he can't win no other way, you know, so he has to break the rules. After Tyson's outburst, he was banned from boxing in Nevada, where the contest was due to take place. State after state refused to let him box. Finally, the fight was held in Memphis, Tennessee, in June 2002. But in the boxing world, 
this was an outlaw fight, eerily reminiscent of the illegal bare-knuckle world of John L. Sullivan more than a century before. When we got into the ring, there was like, first time I've ever seen that, a body of men, you know, like a human chain across the ring. Interesting, but my focus was just on Mike Tyson. The bell goes, referee Eddie Cotton, who's no small man himself, some six feet five, in against these two men who've been destined to meet. Well, After the first few the minutes, it was clear that Tyson was long past his ferocious best. Mean, menacing, good right, right through the guard of Tyson, and again, this is two good shots from Lewis. Tyson comes back with a left, but was pretty ineffective. Lewis was winning every round, outboxing, outmaneuvering, and outpunching Tyson. I'm a mover boxer, puncher, and uh, I basically said, you know, let me go in there and do what comes naturally. I did, and you know, he couldn't touch me. You're fighting for the heavyweight champion because I want a head. You understand? Not many people can do that. You understand? But if Tyson was going to lose, how would he take defeat? Would he resort to the shameless rule-breaking tactics he had used before? The answer came in the eighth round. And Lewis sensing that this is going to be his contest. There's a great right hand. Down he goes. Surely that's it all over. As the ref was actually counting, you know, I was watching. And after he reached five, I was counting with him. <laughs> and then I realized by watching, you know, Mike, he didn't really want any more. And it was, you know, he's, he basically had enough. Well, the bloodied face, I'm sure, of a defeated former champion. Both eyes in a mess. And the referee has called it off. And Lewis has achieved the destiny he always felt was going to be his. And he punched... You know, he fought... Uh, Valiantly, you know, he tried his best, but, uh, you know, I was the better man that day. Mike never had a chance to, there was no way he could win that fight. There was no, absolutely no way. And so instead of doing what Sonny Liston did or what Roberto Duran did, which was to go in, take a couple and say, hey, I'm never going to win. I'm checking out of here. And he says, okay, I'm going to take this beating because everybody feels like I deserve this anyway. And as if to confound the image he himself had helped create, Tyson astonished the boxing world with his gracious reaction to the defeat. And again, he was just splendid, a masterful boxer. I used to take my hand off to you, and he said, please, if you can do, give me one more chance, I'd be greatly appreciative. Before the fight, a lot of people were saying, yo, yeah, I want you to beat Mike Tyson, lay him out like a tree. Yo, we want, some, want, want to give him some manners, man. And, you know, he's misbehaving and all those type of things. And then after the fight, you know, where everybody actually seen the public display, and then, uh, you know, the feeling was different. It was more like, oh, this he might poor Mike. So finally, Tyson achieved public redemption, symbolized by an extraordinary gesture when he wiped the blood off Lewis's face. Like his hero, Jack Dempsey, Tyson too found a kind of victory in defeat. Mike Tyson, Jack Dempsey, and John L. Sullivan were all products of their era. They were also throwbacks to an earlier time, old school prize fighters in an increasingly sophisticated world. They were tamed by the rules and were beaten by youth, fitness, and science. Yet it's these bad men of boxing with their brutal, ferocious intensity who have gone on into legend. You can win a certain way and nobody cares. But if you got that right hand, that knockout power, that is like having the pipe of the Pie Piper. That is like having the loot of the snake charmer, and we're all the snakes. We, we're drawn to it with, while not even knowing we're being drawn to it. We think we're being repelled, we're being drawn. <laughs>